the play of man and woman is on that level, on the level of biology, a reflection of the fundamental play of the cosmos. The play of the positive and negative principles, of the light and the dark, of the mental and the material, they all play together. And the function of sexual play is not merely the survival and utilitarian function of reproducing the species as it is among animals to a very large extent. What peculiarly distinguishes human sexuality is that it brings the partners closer and closer to each other in an intense state of united feeling. In other words, it is a sacrament, the outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace bringing about love. And so, if that is peculiar to human beings, it is perfect nonsense to degrade human sexuality by saying it should only be carried on in the way that the animals do theirs. Because they have not yet, as it were, evolved to the place where sex is the sacramental expression of man and woman's love. And love, in that sense, is a kind of enthusiasm, which means a being possessed by the divine, falling in love, uh, although considered by practical people to be a sort of madness, is actually the same sort of thing as the mystical vision, uh, a grace. And in its light, we see people in their divine aspect. When, as the song says, every little breeze whispers Louise, uh, there is a sort of extraordinary state of mystical intoxication in which the ideal woman has become the goddess. Which is, from one point of view, what every woman is if you see her with the scales of your eyes. And likewise every man is seen with the scales of her eyes. So, what happened then as a result of this historical situation was mutual name calling between the proponents of religion and the proponents of uh, scientific naturalism, such as Freud and uh, Havelock Ellis, and in our own time, Albert Ellis, uh, and people of that kind. They've never got together, because they've never understood neither the church nor the opponents of the church clearly understood that the secret or unconscious motivation of sexual repression is to make it all the more interesting. And on the other side, it has not been clearly understood that sexual biology and all that goes with it is a figuring forth on the level of biology, of what the whole universe is about. Ecstatic play. So as a result, there has been a kind of compromise. Today in ecclesiastical circles, sex is being damned with faint praise. Uh, people are saying, after all, yes, uh, sex was made by God, and we should remember the Jewish point of view. And uh, it is uh, perhaps for something more than reproduction, to bring about the cementing of the marriage ties between us and wives. But, still in practice, it remains the frightening couple. On the other hand, the opposition 
too Christian prudery goes overboard and always moves in the direction of total license. You see, what's going on is a contest between the people who want the skirts pulled down to the floor and the people who want them pulled up to the neck. And you, you know, you've got to draw the line somewhere. But the play between these forces is where are we going to draw it? Well, that's very exciting. Provide neither side wins. I mean, imagine what it would be like if the liberty was won. And they took over the church so that on Wednesday evenings, the young uh, Presbyterian group would meet for prayer through sex. Yeah. Every child would go to the school physician for a course in hygienic and they would have classes and they'd have plastic models and all the children would do it in class. Very <laughs> clean, hygienic circumstances, all sprayed with rubbing alcohol. Everything would be fine. Imagine how boring it would all become. So you see, the people who say no, modesty is important, have something right about them. But they mustn't be allowed to get away with it. But they mustn't be obliterated. You see, life works that way. Let's take an entirely different analogy. Let's take a given biological group, a species we'll call A. It has a natural enemy, B. Now one day, A gets furious at the natural enemy, B, and says, let's obliterate it. And they gather their forces and they knock out their natural enemy. Well, suddenly, after a while, they begin to get weak. They get overpopulated. There's nobody around to eat up their surplus creatures and they don't have to keep their muscles tense against any enemy and they begin to fall apart because they destroyed their enemy what they should do is cultivate the enemy that's the real meaning of love your enemy there is such a thing as a beloved enemy and if you don't have a beloved enemy in other words if the flies and the spiders don't go together there's going to be too many spiders or too many flies